Hello and welcome to Digest This, where we focus on day-to-day -day clinical updates in gastroenterology. I'm Elaine Robertson, a gastroenterology registrar in the west of Scotland, and today we're discussing ileocecal Crohn's disease. I'm delighted to welcome Dr Dan Gaia. Dr Gaia is a consultant gastroenterologist at Glasgow Royal Infirmary with a special interest in inflammatory bowel disease, both in the clinical and in the research setting. Dr Gaia, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Pleasure. Perhaps you can start us off just by giving us a bit of background on Crohn's disease, but on ileocecal Crohn's disease in particular. So Crohn's disease is one of the two chronic inflammatory bowel disorders. Um, one in particular which is increasing in incidence in, in Northern Europe and Scotland in particular. It can present anywhere in the GI tract, uh, but ha has a predilection for the terminal ileum and antececal region, which we term ileocecal Crohn's disease. Um, ileocecal Crohn's disease can present in, in numerous ways, but typically with some abdominal pain, change of bowel habit, and perhaps some systemic symptoms such as weight loss or fever. Let me give you a case then. So a 22-year-old lady is referred to your clinic. She's had six to eight weeks of diarrhea, postprandial abdominal pain, she's lost some weight and she's had mouth ulcers. GP's done stool cultures in the community and they were negative and she's referred to your clinic for further assessment. How would you approach this? Okay, so um, first and foremost, take a detailed history and the, the key points without labouring it, one would want to get in the history in a patient like this is have they been taking any painkillers and in particular any NSAIDs which could muddy the water uh, and certainly cause some intestinal ulceration, stroke, inflammation. Um, other key points in the history, any family history of Crohn's disease. Uh, we know it's a part genetic disorder um, and, and that would heighten your underlying suspicion that the patient may be suffering from IBD. Uh, be that ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Um, examining the patient, you in this setting, you'd be specifically looking for any extra intestinal manifestations of, of Crohn's disease. Uh, so particular interest in the eyes, the skin, the joints, um, and then just a general GI examination. Um, I wouldn't routinely do a perianal or rectal examination unless the patient was complaining of symptoms in that area. Um, thereafter, I would do some routine blood tests, almost certainly check the haematinics um, and, and book further investigations to go forward from there. And if you are thinking about Crohn's disease, are there clues in the presentation that guide you as to which part of the bowel might be affected and how you might investigate? Yeah, I think you do in the sense that if pain and weight loss are major features, then it always makes me think small bowel disease. Uh, and you don't tend to see those features in ulcerative colitis. Um, and weight loss in particular is, is a worrying feature uh, in IBD and Crohn's in particular. Normally suggests small bowel disease, normally suggests fairly advanced small bowel disease, and it's a worrying phenotype in itself. So to go back to our 22-year-old lady, what tests would you arrange? After examining the patient and, and looking at the blood test, we'd almost certainly go on and arrange a colonoscopy um, and with or without an MRI small bowel study. The, the two are of, often used in, in conjunction and practically speaking, we often request both at the same time. Not sure when the first one will happen but they often do give complementary information and, and I think it's a reasonable um, two-pronged approach to the investigation of ileocecal Crohn's disease. Um, the colonoscopy is important to give you some histology and it may not give you the answer. The histology may all be normal. Um, you may not get round to the ileocecal valve. The, you know, and the MRI is often complementary in the sense that it gives you an idea of disease extent um, and can often give you an idea of the degree of colonic disease as well. So, so the two are, are helpful together. And would you do a calprotectin? It would depend on the symptoms. Um, if it was going to stop me doing a colonoscopy, 
If it was normal, then I might. If my clinical suspicion was such that this patient is getting scoped and they're getting an MRI scan, I probably wouldn't do a carpetectin at that juncture. Okay, so let's say she has a small bowel MRI and she has a colonoscopy. So the colonoscopy shows inflammation, moderate inflammation and aphthous ulceration in the cecum. Terminal ileum is not intubated, wasn't me. Uh, and the small bowel MRI shows a uh, terminal ileitis, distal 7 centimetres, but without upstream dilatation. How does that move things forward? And can I ask, has the patient got any obstructive symptoms at this time? Any vomiting or...? So there's no vomiting, but she does have postprandial abdominal pain. Um, and the histology was supportive? So the histology shows moderate inflammation, uh, but no granulomas. Okay. So I think I'm fairly confident that we have an inflammatory phenotype here, perhaps with a tendency towards stricturing, uh, and that the diagnosis is likely to be ileocecal Crohn's disease. Um, I think in the first instance, I would educate the patient, and by that I would refer her on to my IBD nursing colleagues who would do that for me, uh, tell her about Crohn's disease, tell her about the, um, the long-term nature of the disorder and that, the, any drugs we would use would not in any way cure it. Um, I think we are particularly bad at utilising our dietetic colleagues in this setting. Um, there's very good evidence for the use of exclusive enteral nutrition, to induce remission, it has the same uh, remission rates as a course of corticosteroids and has none of the side effects, but our patients tend not to like it, but I would certainly give her the option of that. Um, I generally don't use five aminosalicylic acid drugs in this situation just because of the lack of evidence for them. Um, if the, uh, the patient in question was not keen for a course of EEN, then I probably would prescribe budesonide uh, as opposed to prednisolone. So budesonide, a steroid with a um, predilection for release at the ileocecal region and um, a high first pass metabolism. So uh, in theory, uh, less systemic side effects. Um, I would also probably at that point check a TPMT assay. So the rate limiting enzyme in thiopurine metabolism and counsel the patient about going on a thiopurine at that juncture. And are there any scores that we can use to give us a guide as to severity or to guide treatment? Yeah, I, I just use clinical judgment and you know there's, there's two widely used endoscopic scores, the SESCD and the CDEIS, uh, which we've used numerous times, all as part of clinical trials, but they don't tend to change my management. They're important in clinical trials because they're sort of hard endpoints in management and endoscopic mucosal healing outcomes, but I don't use them in clinical practice. What about clinical scores, the Harvey Bradshaw Index, for example? Yeah, I mean, our IBD nurses use this regularly to monitor patients on second-line therapies and to give us some sort of objective guide to improvement or lack thereof. And thinking back to the case, would you start maintenance therapy at this point? Yeah, I almost certainly would. Um, you know, the literature isn't clear on this, and some gastroenterologists would, would wait for the second flare. However, we've got a young patient with an incurable disorder whose life potentially could get seriously disrupted if we don't get the treatment right. Um, and I would go for second line therapy, maintenance therapy at this juncture. That is my practice. Um, I would also offer the, you know, depending on what stage in life the patient was at, the, the option of a limited laparoscopic ileocecal resection. Um, nobody knows whether that's the right thing to do at this juncture. Um, but, you know, for example, if the, the patient in question had important exams coming up, important life events, didn't want to be on long-term medical therapy, then there is no reason why they wouldn't get five or ten years um, disease-free remission uh, by going down an early surgical route. Um, but most patients do not want an operation and want medical therapies. So we've come in with moderately active Crohn's disease, but what if we were at the different ends of the spectrum, so either mild or indeed severe? Mild being quite often picked up, for example, as part of the bowel screening pro programme. How would your approach differ? 
I think it does. Uh, I think if the patient has no symptoms and minimal macroscopic disease, then your entirely reasonable path should be just to monitor them, observe and review uh, and do nothing else. Do first do no harm. Um, we don't know what the natural history of Crohn's disease picked up as part of the bowel cancer screening program is. It may well be that these patients all have a very benign phenotype and run into no problem, live their whole life with their apathy in the right colon and that we don't need to interfere with that. On the flip side of the coin, we do have patients who present with penetrating complications, um, an abscess or early fistulation, um, either to, to small bowel to colon or small bowel to skin. Uh, and in these patients, uh, you know, certainly with the, the penetrating complications, an early surgical approach is almost inevitable uh, and then start again. And are there any patients where you would start anti-TNFs at the outset? Yes, there are. Um, and I think you know, these tend to be the patients who present at the most severe end of the spectrum. So um, perhaps a patient with widespread small bowel disease in whom surgery is a particularly unattractive option. Or a patient who has structuring disease uh, who is not keen to consider surgical therapy and has no obstructive symptoms at present. Now the latter cohort of patients were all, were all excluded from the original anti-TNF trials, uh, but clinical experience has shown us that if they've got inflammatory stricture and disease, they actually do extremely well with anti-TNF therapy and surgery can be safely avoided and the disease downstaged. So if we go back again to our case, we've started treatment, how are you going to follow her up? So uh, a combination of clinical review Fecal carprotectin, which is particularly useful in, the, in this setting, uh, and imaging as needed. Uh, now, carprotectin, once we've got a diagnosis before treatment has started, is an incredibly useful baseline value to have. And we do measure it serially, uh, and there's evidence to suggest that following it serially is important for outcomes, uh, showing a sequential fall and objective evidence that you are achieving something in your medical and or surgical therapy is important. It's a cheap non-invasive test and we should all be using it. Um, I think if carprotectin is showing signs of uh, flipping up, then we would reassess disease cross-sectionally by way of MR or CT and endoscopically by way of, of colonoscopy. And if things aren't settling as you would like? If the patient had recurrent disease, um, again, we would generally escalate them depending on what they were on at, at, at that point in time. So if they were on um, azathioprine, I think in the first instance, we'd check the thiopurine metabolites and just check that they were being dosed correctly. If the thiopurine metabolites were um, therapeutic, then we would counsel them and escalate them probably on to an anti-TNF agent. In patients like this with ileocecal Crohn's disease, what's the prognosis? Variable. I think is fair to say. Uh, patients who present with penetrating complications or diffuse small bowel disease have a worse outcome than those who present with a couple of aphthous ulcers in their terminal ileum. Uh, and you know, you sort of, you do get a feel for it at presentation as to who's going to do well and who's going to do badly. There, you know, but unfortunately there isn't a test which you can do at the bedside which uh, which categorises patients into a nice uh, cohort of one, two or three um, and you do have to follow them sequentially. There's been such a change in the landscape of the drugs that are available for IBD and a sense of more to come. Is there anything that you see changing your management strategy in the next five or ten years? Um. It's a good question. I think the simple answer is yes. Uh, we have new drugs available, new classes of biological agents available now and probably later this year. Uh, we have Vedolizumab, which is the first in class, uh, anti-integrin, so it's a lymphocyte tracking blocker, which uh, blocks activated white blood cells, leaving the circulation to go to the gut. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, the main uh, drawback of utilising this therapy is that it takes longer to work, especially in Crohn's disease, than anti-TNF agents do. 
um, and you know you're looking at three to four months down the line before you would see any clinical gain. Um, the next one, next agent on the horizon is Ustekinumab, um, which we're expecting to launch in November, December. This is, a non, this is a, an interleukin agent, which again, similar to verolizumab, the efficacy data is better in TNF naive patients. However, um, I suspect it's going to be utilised as vedolizumab is in TNF failures. Okay, so let me leave you with a challenge. Are there any key messages that we should take away from the discussion today? Um, I think allocecal Crohn's disease has many faces, um, from the benign to the very aggressive. Um, no two patients are the same. Uh, individually assess your patient, follow them up closely, don't be afraid to escalate them. Uh, what, you know, if close monitoring is suggesting you're losing control, then escalate them onto the next agent uh, and close liaison with your colorectal surgical colleagues will be your friend. So let me just thank you for a fantastic update on an important topic and thank you for joining us for Digest This. <laughs>